So Tapua Guja describes himself as a cultural ambassador and advocate. He's also a molecular biology PhD who makes some of the most delicious handmade ice cream in Cape Town under the brand name Tapi Tapi. So Tapiwa, hello. You describe yourself, you describe ice cream as just a vehicle, but what is the journey that you hope to take your customers on? The journey for me is uh, it's a few different layers, depending on who shows up in the cafe. Sometimes it's uh, someone who is unaware of their own culture and I'm trying to reintroduce them to some of the things from their own story that maybe they didn't get a chance to learn as a child or they grew up in a different context independent of their culture. And then other times it's meeting someone who has, who used to know that but has forgotten um, their origins and I'm trying to give them a reminder. And sometimes it's introducing other cultures to my culture and other African cultures on the continent. So the journey varies depending on the spirit that's shown up as opposed to my intentions always. Yeah. And what are you showing us today? Uh, today we've got a few different things on the cook over here. So what I'm trying to do is a celebration of two different things. Number one is this fruit um, called uh, mukokolo or umkokolo. It's a wild fruit from South Africa all the way up to Kenya. You get it in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Tanzania, all the way up to Kenya. And it's quite tart in flavor. If you think a lemon is sour, this is maybe like, a lemon is like a four out of 10, this is like a 10 out of 10 compared to a lemon. So it's like really tart, but you can do some amazing things with it. And at the same time, I'm also working with millet. So this is flour from millet, which is a grain uh, endemic to the continent of the whole. So you get a lot in West Africa, East Africa, and Central and Southern Africa. Not so much in Northern Africa, um, but it goes all the way up to India as well. Uh, you get maybe something like 140 different varieties within India and in, on the continent as well. So because I have a sweet tooth, the, the demo and the menu in general today is going to be sweet leaning. And we're going to start making a millet and sour milk lava pudding. Um, so I've got some homemade sour milk here. Um, Coca-Cola, Amasi, Lala, or whatever you call it in your home language. So I make my own using uh, the old school technique of just like leaving it be and let it ferment by itself. And I like mine quite thin. So if you can see, the texture is quite thin. You oh, sort yes. of cook yeah. so, um, other kinds. Um, I don't like the thick stuff. I like a runny milk, whether sweet or sour. So first step for my pudding, uh, basically switch the oven up to 200 Celsius for a preheat. It's quite a straightforward recipe. In this blender jug, I've got uh, 111 grams of melted butter. And to that, I'm going to add 110, 111 mils of my sour milk. Okay. And Tapiwa, the fruit, it, yeah. does it come from a thorny, is it like a thorny bushline? Right, okay, that's interesting. Because in Kenya, you most often see it as a hedge for that very yeah. reason, because yeah. of the thorniness of the, sure. the bush. I was in Kenya in June and I remember people kind of laughing at me when I was telling them this plant is edible and everyone's like, no, 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 we don't do that here. <laughs> <laughs> right. so I remember seeing it everywhere and unfortunately it wasn't fruiting while I was there, but I would have loved to have made some things with it while I was there to showcase to the Kenyans. So yeah. this is to blend the milk together the butter. Just a quick spin on that. All right, if you don't have a neutral bullet type blender, you can use a stick blender or you can use a whisk. This I'm just doing to save time, um, but you don't need it to be this level of uh, industrial machinery. And then after that, I'm going to pop in two egg yolks and two whole eggs. Um, that's just straight in. And then if you're using cup measurements, that's a half a cup of brown sugar or 100 grams of brown sugar. Pop that in there as well. And then back to the blending. So you can also use like a hand um, 
a hand blender with the two whisks on it as well. Like a, like a hand beater. Yeah, like an electric beater, electric beater, yeah. Yeah, for sure. This is just about blending things. There's no need to get fancy with it at all. All right, so that's now nicely mixed in. Then I'll go into the flower section now. And for the flower, what I've got is about 111 grams as well of uh, either plain flour or self raising flour, and about a half a cup of the millet flour. So that's the self raising and that's the millet. And the millet, I like using it because um, it's got a nuttiness to the flavor, it's different. The inspiration was a lava chocolate pudding, which okay. normally using cocoa powder in this step. And I was trying to find a way of uh, enjoying millet that's not uh, porridge or salad or gali. Um, so I often do a pastry related things with millet flour, like pancakes, cakes, biscuits, okay. waffles, that kind of thing. So this is a, a nice, easy dish to use millet in. And the reason I have a mix of millet flour and uh, wheat flour is the gluten content is still going to be relevant to this. So if you're going to be substituting sorghum flour, millet flour, teff flour in your cooking, and you want to make like cakes and breads that are fluffy and that can rise, you need to do at least 50% wheat flour, and then the rest can be your grain of choice. That's how I oh, found okay. in development. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So I just uh, pop that in there. And for this phase, I'm actually going to use a fork. I just don't want to overwork the flour too much. Um, otherwise, you get a bit of a dense texture. So that's why I'm going to use the neutral bullet to blend this time around. OK. Yeah. Uh, you can see now it's getting a little bit brown now from the millet okay. flour. OK. OK. And where do you source? Um, you're in Cape Town. Where do you source your millet flour from? Is, is it something I <laughs> really sourced or it's actually coming from zim <laughs> oh wow <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in, in the millet flour sometimes i use malted millet like the one you used to use my hair to make my hair or uh, beer like wawa um but this one is the unmalted version and again there's a informal market in the place called weinberg here in cape town where i get me more masau mananga avocados me like all these sort of like classic uh zimbabwean foods very easy like as long as they're in, they're in season it's quite easy to get them this side oh, <laughs> perishables like like chanja will be difficult to get your like uh, marula but sometimes you get tsubu as well you want the, the sturdy kind of fruits okay so that's yeah. a sort of um nice thing about the things you produce with them because it's not something that everyone everywhere can replicate unless they um, were to go yeah. to <laughs> you can make substitutions depending where you are right yeah is what i'm saying all right uh so now i just got a little little tart tins here and i'm just gonna give them a little nonstick coating And the nice thing about the little tart shows, you can obviously do nice portion control. Um, instead of making one big one, this is nice for individual plating. I was just going to say, very, very good, um, you know, aiding with the self-control. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although there are only two of us here today, so that's five portions for two people. I don't know if the self-control is particularly high. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now I'm just going to do about uh, two thirds of a cup per tart shell. So I got my little cup measurement here. So that's uh, if you're using volumes, that's 160 mils. Okay. Yeah. And just and remind us again what the final dish is called. 
Oh, so this is like either lava pudding or molten pudding. It's one of those like you bake a cake, but you leave the center moist and gooey. So you kind of have like a salt inside the cake as well. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it's quite okay. um, rich and decadent. It's a nice winter treat, especially with some ice cream, which we have uh, in store as well later on. And I know at your shop, you, 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 you pay, you can pay um, specific ice creams, you know, depending on what people are wanting to have it with, right? Suggest pairings for them. Yeah, 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 for sure. So normally the, the menu has a theme to it. And I typically will have like subtle flavors in the very beginning of the fridge. And then in the middle of the fridge, it's starting to get a bit more adventurous. And then the end of the fridge is full of like your nutty flavors, your sour flavors, your very bold, distinct classics, like, like no people at the very end of the fridge okay. versus like rooibos at the beginning of the fridge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what I normally do with this pudding as well is sometimes I will freeze them at this point. You can put them in the freezer and when you're ready to have them, just pop in the oven for a longer period of time so the nights for like gifting people or for you just like sit down one day and make like a huge batch and then whenever you're craving a pudding you can just like tuck into it oh that's so very like, handy yeah that's yeah. very handy 100 uh i think this one needs a little bit of a top up let me just get a tablespoon here sorry And if you are baking them fresh like this, it's a little bit of an art form. And depending on how gooey you want it, you kind of have to play around a little bit to figure out how long to bake it for. Today, okay. we're going to bake for uh, eight, nine, and 10 minutes. So you can see, I can show you the difference in the outcome. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So you see one of them will be like a cake cooked all the way through. The other one will be a bit maybe on the early side. That one will be like just right. If you have the time for it, I normally would then just put them in the fridge for about 20 minutes. Because the nice thing about lava pudding is if you pre-chill it, when you bake it, it takes a while for the center to warm up and that's where the gooiness is going to be. Oh, I see. Okay, all right. That's if you're making it uh, perfect every time. Pre-chill it or even pre-freeze it, then you're good. I think our oven should be to temperature now. Yeah, so I'm gonna pop that in now. All right. Ideally, I should have been putting them all on one huge tray together because I'm losing heat in the oven now, but it should be all right. Okay. Okay, let's gently close that door and make sure I'm at 200. And get my timer going for nine minutes. Yeah, there you go. Okay, okay. So while that's cooking away, I can show you a little bit of what else I've been doing here. Okay. So this is my sour milk. And um, on the store over here, I've got the Kai apples or mkokolo or mkokolo stewing. Okay. Right. And all I'm going to do now is I'm going to give this a quick blend with a stick blender. And I'm going to show you a few options we can play around with uh, using this fruit in different ways. For people now, in Cape Town, sorry, Tapio, people in Cape Town, are they, um, are the kai apples readily available? Uh, not in supermarkets. You, you can speak to like uh, farmers because the farmers use them as boundary plants as well here in Cape Town. Okay, okay. They tend to be like a byproduct of the farm, but not a product of the farm, if that makes sense. Okay, all right. Um, but I forage mine as well sometimes because uh, there are a bunch of different gardens and uh, residential homes that use them as boundary hedges as well. 
so you have free access okay. to those over time. Oh, great. Yeah. We have, we have now, lovely charging info from... Uh, yeah, we have a question it. about how to de-seed. How do you de-seed your pineapples? Ah, That's exactly okay. it. <laughs> so you can see when you, when you blend it, if you use a neutral bullet, then you're going to end up with a seed, seed kind of um, In problem. your... Yeah, so, okay. So that's why I use a stick blend in this particular instance. All right. Yeah. So while well, that's done now, pop that away. So now I'm going to split this into two. Uh, loosely speaking, you want to do equal parts of this uh, syrup with uh, equal parts sugar. And if we okay. get that on the stove, again, we're going to make a jam. Oh, lovely. Mm. I'm just thinking also, I suppose one can also make stuff like curd. Yeah, um, so that's also coming up in the demo just now. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, so good thinking. And because I, I, you, I make um, kind of a jam quite often, you can see I'm winging my sugars here, but it's normally about half and half jam or uh, sauce to sugar. If you want to put some other things, there may be some salt as well to balance the sweetness. Because the sugar is good for being a preservative, but you also want uh, your jam to taste balanced, not just like sweet or just sour. Okay. So I'm just gonna ramp up the heat now. So that's the jam that's going now. And then I'm gonna take the sour milk now. What I've been doing the last year or so is with the sour milk that I make, I like to put other sour fruits in the sour milk. So like baobab, the kayak or sour figs, um, even umkumboti. If you make like macheo or umkumboti, it's a nice little thing you can pop in your sour milk to give it flavor without necessarily playing around with sugar. Oh, nice, uh, nice. Yeah. I'm just gonna pop that over by the sink. I have it on good authority from um, one of your super fans, who's, who's my sister. She mentioned <laughs> with the kai apple flavored wudzeko, you Put a uh, hole one at the bottom so people see what the fruit is like. Yes, yes. And are uh, able, then you have instructions for us to just mash it along with it. But yeah, that's that's quite a cool way of being able to actually see something that we might not be familiar with. 100%. So same with the baobab as well. You can eat the baobab fruit and seed pods, uh, seeds inside the sour milk. Um, even masao, masao is nice for sour milk as well. Oh, that would be lovely, yeah. Normally mm. sour as well, so that's another layer to it. Um, okay, we have four minutes of the time a day. So now this is now like a nice flavored uh, sour milk. You can add sugar to this if you want to make like a sweet drink, or you can add this with your porridge. Um, you can make uh, what I did with it today. Let me show you that now. Let's grab that from the fridge. Like a lassi. So I was playing around with the idea of Sazenemuka uh, Coca-Cola, which is like uh, pop or like ugali with um, sour milk. Yes. Oh. Have here is a little tart, and the tart shell itself, I've got uh, wheat flour, peanut flour, and millet flour as well. So that's a sadza portion of this ugali, that's a nishima, whatever you call it. Right. Then, I've always found milk tart quite a boring dessert because it's like milk and cinnamon. That's about it in terms of flavor. Right. And I was thinking about how can I make a milk tart that's uh, a bit more interesting, I suppose, a bit more familiar for me as well in terms of the flavors that I know. So what I did is I took the sour milk, some corn flour, some eggs, some a bit of regular flour, and the kai apple. So the kai apple sour milk, sorry, and cook that through to make uh, the base for the uh, the filling for the milk tart. So that's the sour milk component. But before I piped it down, I took a little bit of uh, the curd that I'd made earlier with the kai apple as well. Okay. So now the kai apple in the milk tart, but under the tart there's also a bit of the curd. I could have done with the jam as well. So that's a kai apple jam, and then you've got your millet flour in the base. And I'm just going to cut that open so you can see loosely what that mm. kind of looks like. 
in terms of layers. Um, so that's all right. So we got a bit of a thin little layer down here. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a the nukta through, and then there's your sadza or gali, however you identify it as. Yeah. Okay. And I like using it because it's a local grain as opposed to maize meal, but you can use maize meal no problem at all. Uh, okay. You can also use sorghum. Sorghum is a de more delicate flavor, so it's a neutral base compared to the millet. Um, but so far, they all work. Even teff, teff is a stronger flavor, but all work still. And yeah, that's what I've made today. So as a jam, which is now you can just come over here. You can see the jam is starting to thicken and go darker in color from the sugar addition as well. And I'm just gonna let that cook through until I feel like it's a consistency that I like. I don't really have a time scale on this. It depends on okay. what kind of, I'm looking for a runny jam or more like a thick apricot jam that could be used for like a mango pudding or something like that. Oh, lovely. And I guess with jam, oh, the thing would just be to be careful not to, for us when we're making it at home, not to go over to get to the sort of candying stage, right? Yes, yeah, you, know, yeah, you, you don't want to overcook it for sure. Um, right, okay. It hasn't happened to me, I find it's happened to me with gooseberries, but um, um, it didn't happen to me with figs. So, but now I'm just careful. <laughs> 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 I think sometimes it depends what kind of fruit you're using because if you have uh, like this is quite a thin sauce to start with it's okay. more forgiving it's going to take a long time to thicken and go to that candy phase I think okay okay yeah maybe that's a, that's a good detail maybe yeah um, and how is the how how have you seen the how has the perception of the ingredients that you use changed or evolved <laughs> since you started using them in terms of yeah people's perception? I think it's a confidence game. Um, well, let me let me just pose a question. I'm just gonna get into the oven now. Uh, our time has just gone off. Our time is done. Fantastic. I'm gonna grab one of them. All right, so that's our first little puppy day. Ooh. And you can see, you can see in the middle it's a little bit wobbly still. And I'm just gonna uncup it. So for people who might have missed um, this this part, we are starting with nine minutes. We're we're getting different. Tapi was doing it different levels of moltenness for us to see. So you can see that's still quite molten. Right. right, okay. If we're using a spoon over here, it's a lot of goo and a bit of like baked cake on the outside there. Ooh. So there's a point where you're trying to get it to mostly cook through and some goo. So you can just like enjoy that as a saucy mm. little treat. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's too nice. I'm letting us. Uh... I'm gonna take out the next one now in ten minutes. Okay. All right, and that's still looking quite runny still. Um, and that's all. Obviously, there's a lot of variation between um, ovens and households. So this oven is not my usual oven. So it's. Uh, I think it's cooler than mine. Okay. All right. Yeah. But if we look now. You see now we've got mostly the center. Right, but more cooked yeah. around the edges almost. Yeah. A little bit. Right. And Lovely. obviously it's a matter of preference as well. Ultimately, it's a home, it's a hot dessert. So now it feels hot. You could have it this very way I had in the very first place, if that's what you're about. Um, okay. or you could really push it and try and get to cake territory. I'm gonna pop that aside and create one more. Let's see. So there is a part of this uh, demo as you've presented it to us with the different 
sort of methodically going through the different um, time stages for the for the um, molten puddings mm -hmm. that sort of speaks to a bit of like a science experiment. You know, I'm just wondering how your <laughs> how all that time spent in the lab and um, has sort of influenced. 100%. How you go about in the lab of your kitchen with the mm -hmm. food. Definitely. So like protocols and like setting up station, like I've got all my chemicals or reagents ready. Um, right. So critical to, uh, to success, I suppose. Right. But after a while, there's also a lot of cooking by feeling. Okay. So now I just check the tarts again. It's not quite ready. But in the meantime, I can tell you about the ice cream that I'm having with it. So this oh. is a nice menu at the moment. Um, what I did is that the curd that I used in the tart as well here, I swirled into an ice cream made with uh, sago pudding. So Cape Malay people are heavy into sago pudding. So it's like tapioca pearls with a bit of spice cooked in milk. Okay. And so I made a coconut and sago ice cream swirl together with some kai apple curd so Ooh. reinforces the, the flavors that i've been talking about here and if you wanted to you could also use your kai apple sour milk to make this pudding and okay. uh, that would give you a different flavor profile so nutty and sour or you can keep to a wheat flour on its own and have the flavor all of all the flavor come from the kai apple milk alone okay That's another yeah. playing around with it yeah Hmm. And what does the name Tapi Tapi mean? Oh, Tapi Tapi is, uh, I don't like saying Shona because Shona is, is a colonial classification word. Um, but the language that exists now is Shona and it, uh, Tapi Tapi comes from Kutapira, or, which means to be sweet. So if I say Tapi Tapi, it's like, oh, that's sweet, sweet. Um, that's, that was my inspiration behind it. I think there was a, a jam product back in the day and a song by Olicom Tukwiz that both echo Tapi Tapi or Napi Tapi. And I always knew that if I was going to do a dessert restaurant, I would give you that name, yeah. Oh, fantastic. So that's where it came from. Let's see how we're doing down here. Okay, I think we're ready now. Great. And you describe again the taste of uh, the Kai apple. Someone's the asking the cat. Um, and is it an acquired taste? To eat them on their own, um, you gotta love sour things. So if you're a person who likes like uh, tamarind or grapefruit or lemons or like green mangoes, I think you'd like this fruit um, as, it, as it is raw. But if you're someone who would rather much cook with sour things, uh, you, can, you can tame it very easily. It's not, um, what's the word? Uncontrollable, ungovernable, shall we say. <laughs> right, so you can see now the base is cooked through here. And if I just like go in a little bit, there's a little bit of sauce in the middle there. Oh, fantastic. So this one, maybe I've gone over a little bit, but thankfully we've got some ice cream and that we can just nicely plop in the middle there as well. That will make for a nice. Mm. So that's for me another version of like sadza and sour milk. So the sadza in the millet. So it's a minute sadza with the sour milk ice cream instead of uh, a savory course. It's a dessert course. Yeah, and same oh. thing with the tart with the milk tart, and uh, that's the demo. We're done. Fantastic. Oh. Here's the jam. I think the jam is ready to put aside now. It's going to set. Oh, that looks good. Yeah, that looks good. That looks very settable. Awesome. So Tapi Tap, um, Tapiwa, uh, Tapi Tapi just celebrated its its third birthday last month. Yeah. How has it evolved in these three years? I think the the first uh, from 2018 and to end of 2019. That's a one and a half year period. It was trying to get people familiar with the skill set, I suppose. It was about showing people 
I am good at making ice cream, regardless of the ice cream that I'm making. And I'll do pop-up events, I'll do delivery of ice cream flavors just to get people comfortable. Because unfortunately, that's the nature of the world. As Africans, as Black people, we ourselves are a bit skeptical about our own things and we're a bit um, apprehensive about, oh, we used to eat that in the village, but now I live in the books, I don't do that thing anymore. Or like the idea of like struggle foods. And on the other side, people are unwilling to try new things, uh, especially if we're talking about Europeans, because their normal is the normal for everybody. So transitioning someone out of strawberry into something like um, in paper smoke as a flavor or matoe as a flavor, right? It's quite a difficult ask. And I understand the hesitation. So first of all, I wanted to establish some very simple flavors so people can recognize oh, this guy is good at making ice cream. So I can trust whatever choices making around those flavors will be good, despite my hesitation around those particular ingredients. And then once I open up in a physical location, I now could really embrace the bolder flavors that I always wanted to play with because people can taste in the cafe before they buy a scoop. Even if you're a skeptic, okay. there are seven offerings you can try and if you don't like seven out of seven flavors of my ice cream, that says nothing about me and a lot about you. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So if, if you can find something out of, the menu changes every month, right? So I make seven flavors this week, next week I'll make seven new flavors, maybe seven new flavors. So if you're telling me one and a half years you've been, you've tried to come to Tappi Tappi, that's over 300 flavors from last year alone. If you didn't find something you like, that speaks to me about where you're at in life, your inability to access diverse cultures and your inability to move through the world as it is, as opposed to how you think it should be for people like you. Yeah. Yeah. I have, so my mother, after tasting your ice cream uh, mm -hmm. recently, was raving about how she had just never, first of all, it was incredible, but that she had just never even thought of blackjack in that way before she'd had the mm. blackjack ice cream. Um, so I have it on very good authority, the um, transformative aspect of, of Tapi Tapi. Mm. Thank you, thank you for the feedback. When you read on the Tapi Tapi site, your grandmother seems to have been such a big influence um, and also home, you know, even in the way that you name, name your desserts. Um, so is there, and, and also perhaps your interest in, in plants as well, you know, thinking about your PhD topic, um, is there an Ambuya flavor in the works? <laughs> I've already made it. Um, so growing up, uh, I used to, whenever my grandmother was baking, I was always involved. Sweet Tooth was our thing. Uh, she loved chocolate and biscuits, that kind of thing. And one thing uh, that I learned in my adult was, um, adult life, sorry, was I always knew about fennel. I knew about fennel seeds and fennel the bulb. But when we were growing up, we used to have this tea, we used to call Chinese tea, uh, very inappropriately. And I then had fennel much, much later, and I remembered, oh, this is Chinese tea. Is the leaves from fennel that we used to put in water and then you make a tea. And it took me immediately to my grandmother's house because she had a bush there that I just knew as a tea, not as a vegetable or a bulb, or whatever you want to call it. So I made a sorbet that was inspired by fennel and lemon leaf, uh, like tender lemon leaf shoots and also like lemon flowers. And that one is called Ambuya because when I taste that tea, I immediately think of my grandmother. So it's, the plant is not to do the continent, but the memory very synonymous with home for me. Um, wow. Yeah, I would say that's that's the Ambuya flavor. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and um, and then just going very uh, a little bit like way back, um, connecting the lab with the ice cream venture. Um, it was dry ice. Did you use dry ice yes. from the lab at first? Yeah, I still do actually. I still churn all my ice cream by hand using dry ice. Oh, fantastic. 
Yeah. yeah. There's Great. something, you get a, a superior texture when you churn it by hand because part, part of the scam of being an ice cream company is something called overrun. And what they do is they make ice cream, then they whip it in the same way you whip like egg whites or like try and make meringue. So it's such a very small amount, like from a liter of ice cream, I can make you, from a liter of liquid ice cream, I can make you about four to five liters of frozen ice cream if I whip it hard enough. Okay. And if you try and teach people about flavors, all that air is taken away from an opportunity to be tasting flavor. So if you make a dense product, and my product has no eggs and it's got low cream and high milk, so the fat content is low and the texture is dense, what that translates to is an ability to taste the flavors more authentically. And that's what I'm focused on. It's not about selling as much ice cream as I can. It's about saying, try this thing. Maybe go buy the real thing when you leave this place. You've had your ice cream, but maybe go buy Matemba later on or Mufushwa, Wenyemba, whatever. Yeah. And what's next for Tapi Tapi? Do you by any chance have a recipe book in the works or have you thought <laughs> along those lines? I, full disclosure, I just uh, yesterday tried out the um, the rooibos uh, ginger and clove uh, porridge uh, mm. using finger millet uh, flour, the the mm. gio the gio porridge, um, and on your on your Instagram you had it uh, using maize meal, um, mm. and it was really just so fantastic. Um, yeah, so what's next? And and there's a recipe book in the works. I, I think I, I just want to share a, re, a, a recent thing thought I've been having. There's often pressure or internal external pressure to always be pursuing progress. And instead of uh, celebrating progress, we're also, also enjoying the present. So I'm shifting my ideas about what next means. Um, yeah. I want to sit and enjoy the moment that it is now. Um, but I, have a do, I do have a few ideas in motion. Since the very beginning, I always knew expansion for me didn't mean more ice cream cafes. It didn't mean selling my ice cream in Woolworths and pick and pay. It didn't mean that at all. Because again, the ice cream is a tool and I'm not trying to sell ice cream. What I'm looking for is opening people's minds and changing our mindsets and our attitudes and our self-esteem around our identities. So expansion for me is someone who has some tapi tapi their banker, they realize there are some aspects of bank and finance that exist in their own culture as a free person from Ghana. Can they put that into the banking sector? Can we start inoculating other aspects of our lives with Africanness, right? Because as we live now, I like to say this, we live as European, we live as black skinned Europeans for the most part. There's a very superficial layer of being an African person or being a black person or being a Zimbabwean, being a Shona, being a Kore Kore on a very healthy foundation of whiteness or Europeanness. Even the fact that we're having a chat about ice cream now, ice cream is from China, through Italy, France, America eventually came to Africa. Then Tabua came along and put a bit of Africanness on top. Right? So for me, it's about how do I convince other people to start shifting their fields of expertise to adopt more African values and belief systems. The idea that we have a currency system in Zimbabwe called the Zimbabwean dollar, when from my people, I don't know about other tribes, but for my people, Ndoro is what we used to call currency pre-colonial times. So why don't they have something like Zimbabwe Ndoro? You know, something as simple as that. It's so right. super physical, but it's also quite uh, deep hitting. Yeah. yeah. So for me, expansion is how many people can I convince to see the value in what I'm doing and apply it in their own lives, whether personal or for business or for a greater cause. And part of that then looks at expanding my work beyond food into textiles, into art, into print media, into design. And I've already started a few projects like that. How can I get you to use a clay pot in your electric stove kitchen? For example, if you look at Chinese people, bamboo steamers, sushi mats, uh, Italian pasta, it's all old technology that still lives in their lives now, even if they're living modern lives. And we need to embrace our identities in a way that we stop seeing our things in museums and in galleries. Like, oh, there's a clay pot from 16th century Zimbabwe. 
why can't I show you a clay pot in my house right now that's been modified enough to work on an electric induction stove, you know, or gas stove, whatever. Right. Yeah. For, for expansion for me is like that. Big scale things that normalize a black experience in a way that I shouldn't be a celebration. Tapi tapi shouldn't be a pot, it should be a normal experience. Right? It should be just like, oh, I want some ice cream. Let me go get an OP ice cream. I don't even think about it. Versus a pilgrimage to go see tapi tapi to have some black ice cream. That's messed up. Yeah. So I want to normalize the black experience as many ways as possible. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tapiwa, for that um, demo, but also, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, unfortunately, Zoom hasn't got to the stage yet where we can taste things through, through the, the screen, right. but um, we can all watch this over and take some serious notes. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you all for, for joining in. Um, at the end of this month, we are heading to Nigeria with Lagos on a plate. So we'll mm. see you on August 29th. Stay safe and take care of yourselves. Awesome. Bye. <laughs>